Hello, Nola. Hello, Joseph. It's uh, a great pleasure to be talking to you, um, although very sad that uh, in the present conditions we can't be having this conversation in person. Um, Nola, I feel I've known you all my working life, and uh, indeed, indeed, I probably have. Well, not, not really, not quite all, but nearly. Well, almost all. Yes. Um, almost all. We first met at the Cockpit Theatre in Northwest London, where I started my um, inglorious career in 1973. And I remember that one of my first projects there was to organise events for a festival called Fanfare for Europe. And that was a nationwide celebration to mark Britain's finally joining the EEC, the European Economic Community, which of course became the EU, and which by, as far as I'm concerned, sad symmetry, we just left. And there's going to be a festival to celebrate that too now. Um, anyway, on to happier things. I can't actually remember when you first performed at the cockpit, but I think it was probably not so very long after I started there in 1973. No, um, I did perform several times at the cockpit. I don't think it was, I think it must have been after 74, yeah. 75, that, that, that kind of period. I think that's right. Yes. Well, look, we're going to talk about how our wonderful Mind Festival began. It was basically your suggestion. So we're going to talk um, mostly about you. You've enjoyed a long and successful career that's taken you just about everywhere in the world. I think you probably know how many countries. I do know, and it's 68 countries. 68. I'd love to make 70, but so far it's 68. I doubt if I could actually think of 68 countries, but it's absolutely amazing. And so you must be very used to being um, interviewed. So uh, I hope this will be not difficult. Um, exercise yes. here. But just to start at the beginning, you were born in Australia and came to the UK when you were 13. So did your parents emigrate to England? Uh, not the usual direction, I think. Um, well, we, were, we were certainly going the other way to everybody else. Um, yeah, yeah. But was that so? That, <laughs> that was the, the, the £10 POM coming to us and we were the uh, there were more than ten pound Australians going to to London. Well, it, it, I can only tell you, I think it was a very, very good investment um, on your parents' part. But did you come? Did your family come here specifically so that you could train um, in ballet? They did actually. Uh, uh, I, uh, my father knew that I couldn't continue my education in ballet at the same time. I, had, I would have to actually give one or the other up by the time I got to 13. Uh, and he knew that there were schools in London that, that, uh, that did the both, that educated and you could dance as well. And that was the excuse he made. I'll, I've always been the excuse my family makes uh, for coming to London. But also I think he, he wanted to see London, he wanted to see Europe, he wanted to see England. He was an, uh, an English and history teacher. And he was he was fed up with Australia at the time, and yeah, he, it was you know, it, it was not just me that made made him come over with my family, my family, mum, uh, granny, and brother. And so, where where did you train when you got here? I mean, did you did, did you go to a ballet school straight away? I mean, you were thirteen. Yes, yeah, straight away. I I went to uh, I went to Phyllis Bedell's, which is just down the road from where we ended up in uh, Kilburn uh, for a couple of a couple of months and then I I went on to uh, to Nesta Brookings School that's because the Royal Ballet had advised me to go there or my father to take me there um, <clears throat> because uh, I was too too old for the upper school lower school I mean and too young for the uh, the upper school so I had to wait till I was 16 to to audition for the uh, the Royal Ballet School and at 16 which was a great achievement um I got in to the Royal Ballet School that's well it is a great achievement I mean so you weren't too small too thin too tall too anything you I was I, I actually did a really good audition one of the best auditions I've ever done in my life and not since in fact 
And uh, the teacher said, oh, Mr. Ray, uh, Miss, Mrs. Ray to my mother, your daughter has quality. <laughs> and then they actually took me down to the uh, physiotherapy department and everything was not quite as they expected. Turnout, you know, uh, average. Extension, uh, <laughs> average. Yeah, you're, being, you're being modest, you're being modest, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so what no, after... that's what happened. <laughs> oh. Oh, sorry to hear that. Um, so what happened after that? I mean, I don't know how many years one stays at the Royal Ballet School, but after you, did you get work straight away? Well, they, they begin to, when, when they get a bit, a bit sick of you, <laughs> they, they start to put you in for auditions. I, I auditioned for the Australian Ballet, but didn't get it. Uh, and then I auditioned for Malmo Stadstiaka, which I actually thought at first was in Italy, Malmo, I thought it was Malmo, Italy. <laughs> and that, that really, I really thought that would be a good thing, but soon I discovered that it was Malmo in Sweden. Um, so that's where my career as, as my professional career began, <laughs> in the corps de ballet at Malmo Stadstiaka. <laughs> Well, I'm sure Australian Ballet has been regretting their decision ever since. But so did you have a, um, a successful career there in Malmo? How long did that last? I, uh, it lasted a couple of years, a couple of seasons at Malmo, and I can't say my ballet career was particularly successful, um, mainly because I, I, I wanted to be Margot Fontaine, <laughs> and I obviously wasn't. <clears throat> And at, in Malbo, you had to actually be in a company for years and years before you got anything interesting to do. Uh, and that didn't suit me very much. Um, and then something very magical happened. And you have to ask me about that. What was it that was magical that happened, uh, Nola? <laughs> it was Marcel Marceau coming to my theatre. Right. So, yes, well, that was going to be my next question. When did you decide to jump ship from ballet and uh, become a mime? And uh, did anyone tell you that you should? Was it your idea? And why was that? I, I'd been told in, in the Royal Ballet School and before that, that I was a good mime and you know, I had talent for that. Uh, and when I thought, oh, I, I don't want to be a dancer anymore, but what can I do that can use the technique of dance, but not the voice? I had I, I've had a sort of a hang up about my voice all the time, forever. And mimes don't speak good, dancers don't speak fine. Uh, and so that's why I chose mime. The other thing is I had seen Marceau performing uh, before in, in London when I was about 16 and I'd been knocked out uh, by, by his performance. But at that time, I never really thought I would do anything like that. But when that, that magic, uh, I think it was my mum writing to me, my, that magic information came that he was opening a school and he was coming to Malmo for one night. Uh, I asked him if I could join his school and he said, yes. So, and well, I think afterwards I, afterwards I actually uh, asked him why he said yes. And he said, he said, I couldn't audition you, for instance, as a ballet dancer. I don't know anything about ballet. You don't know anything about mime. You can't be auditioned as a mime because you don't know anything. And so I said yes. And I say yes to all my students for a certain amount of time. Invite them to my school. And if they prove to be talented, keep them on. If not, let them go. <laughs> and that's what's happened. <laughs> well, as far as I know, Marcel Marceau was you know, famously busy. You know, he was touring all over the world all the time. So did he actually teach you? Uh, and if not, who did? Um, ah, yes, he did teach. He was there for two months. He was also playing. He was playing in the, uh, in the same theatre he was teaching in because the studio was, was above the Gaiety Lyric and he was doing a season there. So uh, that was just, just wonderful for me because when I stopped lessons, I'd go and see him in the evenings. And I, I saw at least 30 shows, maybe more, from all angles. <laughs> He's one of the few teachers that, that performs 
<coughs> that you could see the work you're trying to do during the day and then see it perfect in perfection uh, in the evening in the theatre space. Uh, but we also had uh, he, we also had Pierre Verri who was teaching mime uh, mime mask work. Pierre Verri, the the, um, the man who held the signs up. The no. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I found I've always found 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 mask work particularly difficult. Uh, so he tried to teach me mask work, and it's uh, I, I never got on very well with masks. We also had Gérard Le Breton, who was an actor, so we learned a bit about acting. Um, we had Ella. Now, the most important person, I think, for me technically was Ella. Oh no, she's got an unpronounceable name, Jarowski, uh, from uh, from Poland. Do you have another go at that? Sorry. Do you want to have another go at that? I've written it down. I can't pronounce. Jarrow's Wiz. <laughs> She's going to kill me if she ever hears this. Oh, but uh, she was a very, very strict mime technician. And from her, I learned the technique of mime. Uh, and that was the Tomasevsky method. And the Tomasevsky method was, was particularly contemporary dance type of method. It was a dancing, dance mime, as it were. And we also did Eskrin, which is fencing. That's because Marceau fenced himself. And I, I honestly, I can't really tell you why that was important to learn from mine, except to say that you have to have very fast reflexes. Uh, and that's what you need to, to be in mine, to be fast in that way. Uh, and I was, by the way, I was quite lousy at it. I was not good at all. Um, and acrobatics, which I was particularly not very good, but I did learn to do a rather good cartwheel, and that was about it. And then ballet. Well, well, I was all right with ballet. <laughs> well, I think you were very fortunate um, to have actually been taught by Marcel himself. Um, I mean, for yeah. someone who spent his entire professional life in silence, as I'm sure you know, he was actually a wonderful speaker. He gave a an extraordinary lecture at the festival here I mean, many, many years ago. Um, but he was a, a very wise man. Um, and I was hugely impressed. I mean, he, he held an audience in the palm of his hand. Um, and I just wondered, apart from technique, what did you learn from him about life? Well, I mean, in his school, he took uh, improvisation generally uh, that was his main subject improvisation and he'd have he'd say now come on give me a subject and we all go um i, said, I don't know and he, he he had a wonderful subject for improvisation usually solo imp improvisations which i was stupid enough not to write down otherwise i would be doing them and we would do improvisations for him and one of the things he did say, which I will always remember, is that you can be just as boring fast as you can slow. So, because uh, <laughs> pupils, pupils tend to rush when you're improvising, they just want to get it over with. So uh, that was one of his sayings. He was also a really hum humane teacher, human person. He was, he, he, he did not lose his temper with his students ever. Uh, which is pretty good because we were, oh, some of us were pretty bad at mime. <laughs> uh, he didn't lose his temper. He would always come up after a, uh, an improvisation and say, I like the way you did that. <laughs> and that was very nice. Then he'd go, but yeah. have you thought of, and off he'd go, and he'd do the improvisation for you. Uh, and of course, we were sitting there in complete awe. Uh, and he was, he was always wondering whether you were eating enough and whether you were warm enough. And, you know, he was, he was a really, really human person as a teacher. Well, look, last, last thing about Marceau. I've always found it very strange. Um, Marceau was, you know, in his, uh, in his lifetime, one of the most famous people in the world. Um, you know, when he died, he was on the front page of every newspaper in the world. 
he was, uh, you know, in the same category as somebody like Muhammad Ali or Nelson Mandela. Everybody knew who he was. Why do people make fun of him? Uh, I don't know. But it, he was, in fact, last century, say that now, the most famous, one of the most famous Frenchmen ever, I mean, of that century. He and General de Gaulle, I think. Um, why do they make fun of him? Um, he was he was completely unique. Nobody did anything like him. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a style which lots of uh, people copied and were very, very poor copies of him. And I think that's why their fun was made, um, not just not because of him particularly, but because people had seen this these awful shadows of him. Um, and he said to he said to me also. I said uh, I asked him, now, don't don't you feel a bit sort of angry that uh, that some people are copying you, even copying your sketches and uh, and copying your makeup and everything? He said, no. What can I do? Can I? Mean, I'm here to teach mm. you Marceau. I can't teach you anything else. Mm. It's up to you after that to come out and and do your own your own thing. And that's uh, that went in quite deeply, and I decided not to be a small master. Um, no, well, that, I think that was a very good decision, and that's uh, you know that's why you have become a star because you are not um, a master impersonator. Um, okay, Nola, the other half of your company um, is somebody called Matthew Ridout. Indeed, it is. Um, where did you find such a brilliant all-rounder? Um, and because he's such a modest, self-effacing bloke, um, can you sing his praises a bit? Can you tell us exactly or precisely <laughs> what he does? Well, Matthew, I, I met him in 1972, and we've been together ever since. Uh, what we, he was he. Well, no, I've got to get this. I've got to get my teeth in to say this. Um, Where did you meet him? I, mean, I, I met him up through Friends Roadshow which I haven't talked about yet, but that was one of the companies I co-founded with the, the American clown Django Edwards, and we met up at the City Literary Institute. <laughs> and we worked out of Oval House mainly, and we toured especially to, uh, to Amsterdam and Holland, and also to Paris in, in particular. But Marceau was, uh, uh, sorry, Marceau was not involved in that. Uh, Matthew was, <laughs> <laughs> Matthew I met, with that company and he'd come to join Friends Roadshow as, as a technician with, with two of his colleagues to be the technical of, 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 uh, of Friends Roadshow, first of all. And that's where he learned his trade. And mm -hmm. without him, uh, I don't think I would be doing the same quality of show. It wouldn't have the same, well, it just wouldn't be the same. It would be poor, much poorer because lighting is, so it's so important in the show and the sound we have we have quite complicated sound and for that i must have here mention peter west who i met at the cockpit uh, and you 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 introduced me to him he was our he was our composer for quite a while and a wonderful person to work with but our music was very important you had to have someone who was good at splicing tape in those days and had a musical ear, which, with which Matthew really has his very, very musical. Um, lighting is, as I'm saying, is, is particularly, particularly uh, important. Uh, and also, he, we, we began to get um, sets. We began to design sets, and Matthew designed all those and made them as well. Um, he, he's also a, a, an artist, a graphic artist, and so he he. He painted the posters that we have. Uh, he took all the photographs. He drove the truck. <laughs> he cooked. I mean, cooks. I mean, uh, yes. Well, you've been very, you've been very lucky. Um, oh, he's been very lucky. Yeah, yeah. So, Nola, you, um, we met, as I said at the outset, at the cockpit. You had been there. You had performed a couple of times, uh, or maybe more than a couple of times, and. I thought you were a marvellous performer and you convinced me that mime and clown theatre were valuable art forms and potentially really popular and that they could attract an audience 
if properly promoted. Um, I think you were probably telling me that we weren't properly promoting you at the cockpit at the time, probably right. Well, actually, uh, it was at the cockpit, it seems that this kind of show, the mime show, did get good audiences, better than most of the audiences at the cockpit. In fact, this subject was, in those days, uh, interested people. And I have to go back to wonderful Marceau again, because he, he, plays, he played in the West End, he'd sold out the season in a big theatre. So it wasn't unknown. Mine was not unknown even you know, before, before the festival started. It no. was known. But um, um, uh, there weren't really any other big names or any names really at all. And I remember very well, we had lots of discussions. And in the end, we agreed that some sort of festival or season would be a, a good way to promote British artists, uh, that it would attract media attention in the way that a sort of one-off performance couldn't. And, you know, that that in turn would bring in audiences. And I remember that you told me about just such a, a festival in Cologne in Germany, um, which was based in a small theater um, run by a, a Czech mime, Milan Sladek, who had, um, yes. he had escaped or emigrated from Czechoslovakia after Russia clamped down in 1968. Um, that was the Gaukler Festival, and you performed there in, well, in 1976. And I went there the following year and found it incredibly exciting and inspiring, and it was very well funded, that was obvious. Um, and it had the backing of the city, that's a, a far cry from what we, could have, I think, at that stage. And it was one of my first experiences, or my first experience probably, of seeing theatre abroad. And I was used to orderly queues and doors opening 10 minutes before start time and start time being um, as advertised as being the start time. And it was all very different and a huge surprise. Uh, and it was wonderful. And some of the artists I saw there were simply amazing and I wanted to do something well, I wanted to create a festival like that in London. Um, apart from that festival, Nola, um, in Cologne, what other physical theatre festivals, visual theatre, mime festivals were you aware of or had you performed in by that time in 1976? Well, the, the biggest one has to be the Festival of Fools which Django Edwards uh, from Friends Roadshow really instigated, and that was a huge festival uh, of this kind of, this kind of nutty work, mime, clowning, uh, this kind of up over the top and above and, you know, underneath. It was, uh, it was a very, very popular, uh, and uh, and that's that was the first big festival that that I that I attended. Uh, Galkla, yes, was important because there there are people they were mimes. Galkla you know, was a mime festival and not a sort of a clowning festival necessarily. But when I say mime festival, I also mean that clown and mime is very close and they sister yeah. up. So you know they are. Well, I think no, I think I seem to remember Gautla means a sort of a tumbler, a, a street performer, something yeah, like that, doesn't it? It means juggler, actually, but I'm not sure. Okay, okay. No juggling in it. <laughs> Since you mentioned Django Edwards, who did come, I think, in 1978, didn't he, and blew our little theatre yeah. part. Um, did, did you miss being part of an ensemble? Uh, I, I, I enjoy, I really enjoy working with other people and, and I did enjoy working with Friends Roadshow. It was, it was chaotic. It was just, it wasn't chaotic. It was, it was, what's the word, um, structured chaos. <laughs> it couldn't be chaotic, otherwise we couldn't have done it. Uh, it was structured, it looked chaos, it looked new, it looked, it was uh, very silly. In fact, uh, it was to be silly. That the whole thing of Friends Roadshow Road was to actually be as silly as possible, mm -hmm. um, and to play as many to as many people as we could. Mm -hmm. So that, and I miss the camaraderie of of a big company or any company, to be honest with you. Uh, 
but the, the most, what's the word, the most lonely time for me is making up a man in, uh, in a dressing room. Uh, but when I get on stage, I'm not alone. I've got my audience, I've got Matthew, I've got, you know, then I'm, I'm no longer, uh, I'm no, no longer, uh, what's the word, lonely. But it, no. the okay. dressing room is lonely without someone to chat to. Well, look, the first, the first mime festival, um, which happened at your instigation, was called the Cockpit Festival of Mime and Visual Theatre. Um, <clears throat> so it wasn't just about mime, um, and it was, I think we had the subtitle there, Mimes, Clowns and Visual Theatre. It was all planned quite late. It was going to be a, a one-off, and we decided to make it an all-British affair. Uh, to promote British artists, as I said, but can you remember how we went about finding performers? I think, I think you knew several people. Um, I'm sure you did. There was Annie Stainer and Chris Harris, um, for example. I don't think I knew anyone at that stage except you. So what did we do? Did we did we put an advert out in the in the stage? I something like that. I just can't remember how what we, <laughs> did. we we must have done that or something. But I I'd seen. Uh, quite a few performers at, in Amsterdam and so I pointed them towards the Mind Festival so uh, at least half of them had performed in uh, in recent memory there at, at, in, uh, in Amsterdam. Otherwise I think maybe we just asked or we were asked by people if they could come and we just like Marceau said yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes well, I, I remember that was maybe it wasn't so wise. I mean, most people were extremely interesting and good. We did have one or two perhaps that we might have regretted um, in retrospect. But anyway, it was, the fact was, it was incredibly successful. It all sold out. And um, well, I decided to do it again. And I ran the festival pretty much single handedly for the next 10 years um, until 1979 at the cockpit and then from an arts management company that I'd formed with uh, Stephen Hetherington. And the festival was, you know, after the first two years, I think, was taking place in more than one venue. Um, in fact, half a dozen venues um, uh, by about the early 1980s. Um, and these included the Shaw Theatre, which in those days was a serious sort of almost West End theatre. The 500 play seats. 500 yeah. seats. Which was 500 seats, indeed. Step up from the cockpit. Yeah. Um, uh, the place, which was obviously um, uh, well known as a dance venue, and very importantly for our profile, the ICA. Um, but I knew that I was getting quite exhausted and it was a great day for me and for the festival when Helen Lanigan agreed to join me. Uh, I think that was in 1987 and we've run it together ever since. And it developed enormously um, with her contribution. And frankly, I have to say it wouldn't have survived without her energy and talents. And it still does. Um, Nola. Yes. Um, <laughs> do you think you should have created a school uh, possibly, possibly. Um, I think it's. And I ask. I ask because when you, when it started, you could learn mime in London at the City Literary Institute with Ronald Wilson, who was a. That's right. Yeah. An excellent teacher, and mm. in in subsequent years, quite a few mime schools started and were quite successful. Some more than others and uh, some survived for quite a long time. Desmond Jones's school and Théâtre de Lange Fou school and quite a lot. And, and now there's almost nothing again. Um, any idea why that is? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think some of the, the permanent schools moved, moved to Berlin and, uh, and elsewhere, mainly because of the funding situation, I think, as far as I know. And so now we have just courses, uh, mainly through the London, from the London International Mind Festival. Yes. yes. 
I think it's I think it's incredibly important that we pass on this art uh, as as best we can. Um, not to make people great mimes necessarily, because that would be that would be practically impossible unless you you have another you know, a, a naturally what's the word. Uh, <clears throat> someone who's born to be a mime or a clown, that's the same thing. But the technique and, and the, the philosophy and yes, the rules of mime are extremely important for all other arts, I think, apart from painting and sculpture, uh, because it makes you present yourself better. It makes you articulate, it makes you use your eyes, it makes you use your hands better. And I think that every artist, ballet dancers, opera singers, uh, certainly actors, should should know something about mime and the principles of mime. Mm. And so these courses that we put on with various various mimes and various things connected to mime are very important. Mm. Well, that's absolutely true, and that's one of the most successful elements um, of the festival, as you as you've said. And we have a very wide range of workshops, puppetry, clown theatre. Um, we've talked a lot about mime because that's the, that's the word we use in our title. Um, and in all honesty, one has to say that there hasn't actually been very much mime in the sense that people understand it from, well, pretty much from- The beginning. <laughs> yeah, from the beginning. Um, so the festival covers a sort of huge range of visual theatre um, and we've stuck with the word we, because you know it's been successful for us. Um, as this conversation is going to be part of our archive I suppose and so um, that makes it a matter of record, uh, I would just like to pay tribute to a few people who helped at the very start and you will re remember them very well I'm sure. Um, there are lots, um, but those who come to mind straight away um, are the late Jane Nicholas of the Arts Council of Great Britain. Um, well, you'll remember Jane Nicholas because she was the dance officer who gave us our grant in the first place. And the reason she, you know, we, we wrote a great big proposal, it was all marvellous. Um, and then afterwards, I, and we got 1500 pounds, which was not nothing. Um, and then shortly afterwards, I discovered, because Jane told me the reason that she gave us a grant was because you were, or you had been a ballerina, and so had she. So there you go. Um, anyway, there was Jane Nicholas and her assistant Val Bourne, um, the Daily Telegraph's dance critic Ferno Hall, who reviewed every show in that first year, and he managed to have his reviews published. Um, nothing was ever spiked, that was brilliant. Um, Anne Morley Priestman, who reviewed everything for the stage, and a big, a really big acknowledgement here for Time Out's dance critic, the late Jan Murray, um, a larger than life, fast talking Canadian whose interest and enthusiasm were incredibly uh, valuable to us. Um, I'd like to mention Andrew Welsh, who's the director of Warwick Arts Centre in the late 1970s. And he was the first person um, who wanted to take shows from the Mime Festival and create a sort of regional spin-off festival, which he did for many years, um, as did uh, somebody called Geoffrey Axworthy at the Sherman Theatre in Cardiff and Robert Adams in Hemel Hempstead. And John Ashford and Michael Morris invited us to their programme at the ICA very early on, I think it was 1980, which, um, which made us very cool, uh, as indeed, of course, we were. And um, finally, our, our first proper publicists, Erica Bolton and Jane Quinn, who uh, I think it was their first job and they were amazing. They got us onto front covers and into Sunday supplements and that raised our profile hugely. So I'm, I'm very sorry for all the other people who were helpful who's, I can't quite remember, but uh, you know, one can't, can't mention everybody. I think you should mention the British Council as well. 
Very good. You just did. So, um, well, the British Council, presumably, took, I don't know what they did for us in the very first year, but they certainly were fantastically helpful in exporting you to, as you said at the beginning, 68 countries. I think you must have been their most travelled, the most travelled British artist of the uh, of the age. We did, we did quite well, actually, but then we were also the cheapest. <laughs> Only two of us, so, <laughs> and at one point with John Mowat, there were three of us. But uh, we were, and we had no great sets at that time. You, we, uh, we didn't have all the material the Royal Shakespeare Company had, and so <laughs> we were pretty cheap to travel. Okay. But and we also, we also did shows that people could understand. <laughs> yeah, that's obvious. Well, look, no, it's been really lovely talking to you. It's very nice to, um, you know to go back, to think back to, to the beginnings. Uh, I don't think either of us could possibly have imagined we'd be having this conversation, uh, whatever it is, 44 years later, and um, that this festival is, well, I say, Helen and I say, uh, that it's the longest running, the longest established annual international theatre festival in the country. And nobody ever contradicts us. Now that's either because they're just not interested or um, possibly because it's true. Uh, and I think that's a fantastic achievement and you should be extremely pleased with yourself for having thought about it. I'm and I think with that... Um, I'm very well, pleased, Joe. I'm extremely pleased. When I sit in audiences now, uh, for many years I've been uh, sitting in audiences, four houses, and I'm looking around and I say, this is my festival. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I know I'm not at your festival and, and Helen's festival, but I think this is my festival. I, I really am very, very proud. That's quite all right. You're entitled to, uh, to, to absolutely entitled to feel proud. Um, but it's odd, isn't it? Um, one thing I sort of meant to say earlier was when I was talking about how there were no, uh, no names in, um, in this world anymore. Um, and you go to, you know, one of the venues we use, let's say the biggest venue, I think, is the Barbican, or maybe it's San as well, so I can't remember, but, you know, there are 1,500 people yeah. at a show um, put on by a company that they probably had never heard of, and that means that they trust the festival, they trust its reputation, they trust its taste, and I think that is the thing that makes me proudest of, uh, uh, of anything, you know. Why do people come to our events? Some, some come because uh, it's the festival, some come because they've seen it uh, in Sadler's Wells or the Barbican or the ICA's publicity. But it's just extraordinary. And I think we're very lucky to have had, or to have the festival that will go on this journey with us, you know, a curious public um, who, who trust us. So that's great. Nola, I'm going to uh, let you go now. Um, thank you. It's been great having this conversation and I thank you. And thank you, Joseph. <laughs>